What was your takeaway from that experience as the EP and director on on that season of Brockmire? Well, my takeaway was how much I learned about writing mm. and production and how the two things work in the, in the real world when you have to sign something that says, yes, you can make it for this money. When, right. you, get to, when you get to that point where somebody's putting the budget in front of you and you got to sign a little piece of paper that says... I can make it for that money. Things get real, real fast. I just learned to be a better producer. I learned to understand that every cost matters. Yeah. And treat your team well. And they will go the extra mile for you, knowing that it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you take care of your people. Mm -hmm. And also understand that every scene is not about hitting a home run. You know, it's the, it's the collective nature of scenes, the pieces of scenes that go from one to the other. Because, you know, you, you want to make everything dope. And at the end of the day, it's just two people really talking. Right. That's really all it is. And they're sitting down. Right. So you're just like, oh, I just need some overs and I need a nice big wide shot because I want to get this vista. Right. And getting to that patience inside of you is hard at times. And understanding the power of simplicity, I think, is what I took from hmm. that. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Visit PeteChapman.com to get your official podcast merch, hoodies, hats, jackets, mugs, and other swag, and learn more about your host. All right, all right. What's up, people? Welcome to episode 55 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. I am recording this intro on Monday, October 30th at about 10 a.m. in the morning. And this intro is for my friend, my 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 directing comrade and someone that I, I've looked up to for quite some time, Mr. Mo Marable. Some might know him as Maurice, but he and my phone is Mo. So today's guest is the director Mo Marable. But before we get into it, as you know, the little bit of quick catch up. And what have I got to say for this week? Not much going on in the director part of my life. As y'all know, the strike continues. I think the word on the street and the word from all the trades is that a deal is anticipated this week. But as we all know, what's in the room is what's in the room. The rest is hearsay. Who knows? But I sure would be excited about a fair deal being reached by the conclusion of this week, which would be the first week of November. Happy Halloween to y'all who, who get out there and trick or treat. But in the, in the interim, we just got back. My wife and I got back from New York. We went to go support some incredible Broadway theater in particular. We went to see Jaja's African hair braiding. And let me tell you, that shit was dope. Jocelyn B.O. is the writer of that play. She also did Mean Girls. She's someone who's been in front of the camera, someone who's been behind the keyboard. <laughs> Maybe I just coined that. Maybe I just made that phrase up. But Jaja's African hair braiding is amazing. And this is her first work on Broadway. I strongly urge people to check it out before the run is complete. It's a super powerful play. It's got some of the most well-rounded characters that I've seen on stage or on film and in TV in, in 90 minutes. And I think it's a real treat. I, I, I would hesitate to tell you anything about it that might step on the idea. But while we are here, I'm going to pull up the synopsis so you can know what this play is about in the wording of how they want this play presented. So let me see. Maybe, maybe what I'll do is go ahead and give you a little bit from the New York Times, which says, review at Jaja's, where everybody knows your main. Jocelyn Bio's Broadway playwriting debut set in a Harlem hair braiding shop is a hot and hilarious workplace sitcom. 
in all honesty, I think they're minimizing it, but that is a that is accurate. It's just got like any good comedy. It's got layers of passion, of drama, and of things that often go unsaid, well woven into the comedy. So go check it out. Jaja's African Hair Braiding. Strongly recommend that you do. The other play that we saw was Pearly Victorious, which is from an Ossie Davis play. Well, not from, it is an Ossie Davis play from the 60s, starring Leslie Odom Jr. and Carrie Young, Vanessa Bell Calloway. And another awesome play, a great tone tightrope, as I like to say, which is one of my favorite things in, in, in directing, where you're walking the line between drama and comedy. And I will just give you a little bit of a, breakdown on what that play is about. It's directed by Kenny Leon. And let's see, Pearly Victorious. Let's see. It's a non-Confederate romp through the cotton patch. Uh, a comic riot, the funniest show on Broadway. That's from The Rap. So I support y'all in going to check out both of these plays and see what Black theater is doing on Broadway because people are doing a lot and it needs y'all support. So now we will transition to our star of the show today, my man, Mo Marable. And they say you can be a jack of all trades, master of none. But I think that this gentleman is a master of all the trades that he's applied his hand to. He is a director. He's done commercials, film, TV. He's done some incredible title sequences. He He's been... A producing director. I bet he's got a couple scripts on that computer somewhere too, but just kind of a, a modern renaissance creator, if I may, and a pleasure to talk to. Mo Marable is a graduate of Georgia State. Actually, no, I'm sorry. He went to Georgia State University, but he dropped out to travel for music videos. And we'll, we'll get into that story in the interview. He's best known for Brock Meyer, Insecure, Woke, and Killing It, and he made his series TV debut in 2015 with The Game. Other titles that he's been associated with include title design for Deaf Poetry, the most deaf opening, Cedric the Entertainer Presents, Carnival, the show behind the show, and Deadwood, the show behind the show, both for HBO. He was director on the Carnival one and EP on both of those. He's directed Veep. We get into that story. It's always sunny in Philadelphia, Happen Leonard, Suits, Wrecked, Miracle Workers, The Last OG. That was the first time where we actually, I think, met and 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 it was it was a pleasure. And I think that was the first time that we were back to back because when we did Insecure, I think I did episode 302 and Mo did episode 303. So it's great as a director behind the scenes to kind of get the baton or pass the baton to another director and learn what, you know, things to look out for on a particular show or what the best ways to succeed in in realizing your episode might be. And he was always open and honest with that. So much respect due on that. Let's see what else we have here. Grand Crew. Let's see. And he's got a few movies that are in development too. So we'll get into all of that, y'all. I'm not going to just read you a a list of Wikipedia (laughs) credits. I'll let you hear from the man himself. So with that, let's get to our interview here on episode 55 with my man, Mo Marable. Roll sound. Speed. The interview. Take one. All right, brother. So tell me where you're from. I know we're talking to you in Atlanta, but where where are the roots? Where are you from? Yo, the roots. My dad was in the military, right? So I bounced I bounced around a lot as a kid. I, I how can I say this? My people though, and what I claim is Georgia. Look, my 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 folks are from Valdosta, Georgia. They grew up in the country on farms, you know. So we, you know, we we good old country folk. He's good Bal- old country folk. And that's Bal- Baldasta? Valdosta. Actually, Bal- Valdosta, Georgia, but actually, my mother lives in Dixie, Georgia. Okay. Right? It's, um, we will get to that later. She lives in Dixie, Georgia, in the middle of nowhere. But if, if you know people who went to FAMU, she's probably about an hour and a half from there. Okay. Okay. So, how does a young 
a young boy growing up in in the country parts of the rural parts of Georgia get connected to storytelling and 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 wanting to be involved in this business that we're in. You know, like I said, my 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 parents grew up there, but I was blessed, you know, with my dad being in the military. I grew up in Germany. I grew up in Nebraska. Um, I just traveled a lot and 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 just got to experience a lot. And and when we lived in Germany, my mother would take us on these trips like every few months around Europe. You know, it's like driving from Atlanta to Charlotte, you know, like everything right. was just kind of right there. And I kind of fell in love with art and I kind of fell in love with a lot of different things. But when I got to and, and also I love movies, man. like I love movies. I remember when I was about eight years old, I begged my parents to let me go to a movie by myself. And they were like, you out your mind. And, uh, <laughs> Why'd and you I want to go by yourself? Time. I don't know. I just wanted to, you know, when, you, you, when you're a little kid, you want to feel like I'm, I'm grown. You know, I, I'm big. I can do things. Right. And I had an older brother who was four years older than me. And they finally let me go to the movies. And I, I was religious about it. I went to the movies every Saturday. Like I was going to that matinee. I wanted to smell that popcorn. You know, I wanted like it was it was just a part of me. And they finally let me go. And let me say this. We lived on a military base. So it was a little safer than your than your average neighborhood. Right. Right. Um, But I was about two blocks and I noticed my brother was following me like two blocks from (laughs) from behind. Uh huh. And uh, I didn't say anything. I just went to the movie. I sat in my seat, got my popcorn. I don't even remember what the movie was. Uh huh. And. And I had to let my brother wasn't there, but that that's how committed I was. And we should we should tell the listener a matinee is <laughs> the it used to be from like what from eleven to like five p.m. That was the cheapest yeah. show, and it would it could be at least where I was in Jersey, it could be like three dollars. You know what I mean? It exactly. maybe five at the top. And now I don't. Maybe now the matinee is only the first show, if that. If that. They're trying to get all their money. Yeah. They're trying to get all of it. And uh, yeah, so I, I um, so that's where my, my love kind of really took off. And then, but, you know, when you're, when you're not from L.A. or New York or now Atlanta or New Mexico, but when you're not one of these production hubs as a kid, you, you have no idea what this world is like or, or how it's done or, or, you know, for me, everything just felt like it was magic. It felt like, uh, you know, TV was a magic box, you know. Movies were magical in the sense of, like, transporting me places. And I had no idea about this world. The, the only director I knew of back then when I was, you know, I'm, I'm older than Pete, everybody. <laughs> so <that> was, <laughs> but, like, but, like, not even a hop. No, well, it's a hop. But, <laughs> um, but uh, mm. I knew who Steven Spielberg was, right? He had done Jaws. He was, like... You know, like he was an Uber director celebrity, but I didn't know what he did, but I loved, I was trying to figure it out. So I thought how to get into it was go through marketing. I really Mm. did as a kid. I was like, oh, well, commercials are like that and like that. And, you know, I see all these commercials, these movies, maybe I I need to go through marketing. And I remember going to my parents. When did you make this decision? Oh, probably like my ninth grade in high school. So you were focused. Okay. I love it. I, I, I love was, it. Yeah. And I was like, I want to make commercials, you know, first, and then I'm going to make movies. And my dad was like, oh, hell no. And uh, I, uh, when I graduated, my parents were like, nah, you're not, no, no, you need to find something else. Um, so I studied accounting huh. and uh, I, I studied accounting um, and I hated it and I hated it. And I dropped out of school. And I joined the Air Force myself. And then when I found myself, but also when I joined the Air Force, Spike, and we all know Spike, you know Spike. Spike had hit the scene pretty hard. Yeah. Like, he was everywhere. And he was the first black director that got my attention. That, that, that was so loud right. and so about what he was trying to say that it, it hypnotized me. And, and I just started studying everything about what this guy was doing. By this time, he'd only done like Nola Darling and, and School Days. Right. You know what I mean? Like that, right. you know, and I was just like, this dude is amazing. And he was so 
pro black in the sense of getting you know getting black stories out and 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 all those things and I I literally decided to get out of the military. I found a loophole. I had been yeah, in. Yeah, I was for, gonna say I I, I read Catch Twenty Two. That <laughs> <laughs> you don't just get out the military. No, I, I found a loophole and I petitioned to get out early. Only about a uh, six months early. I went back to film school. I went I went back to school, and I went to Georgia State University here in Atlanta. And if Spike Lee spoke within. A hundred miles hmm. of Atlanta somewhere, I was there. Right. You know, I, w- I, was, I was trying to find my way to tell stories. Huh. And he was, again, he was the first black person who, like, like said I could do it, you know. How much is, I don't want to get off the, off the chronology here, but it's funny, like, how, how much of, of even that little bit of time majoring in accounting and then your time in the Air Force has poured into your work or methodology or style as a director now? I'd say probably a lot. And, you know, and I, and I, don't, I don't know if I thought about it until this, this moment, but A, when I started working in the film business, I, I was a PA, right? And then I became a production coordinator. And then I became a production manager and then a line producer. And so accounting just didn't leave, bro. It was right. just like, right. it just kind of stayed there. And then as far as being in the military, I equated to sports. If anybody's ever played sports on a team, the military is very similar. Mm-hmm. It is like there's a mission, there's a goal, and, and, and you may not like everybody, but we all are focused on one thing. Right. And we're going to make that one thing happen. And, and I, just got, I just got really good training. I think the biggest thing that I take into directing, it's not necessarily the discipline, but the idea to breathe. Like when, when shit is hitting the fan and stuff is swirling, mm-hmm. you know, they say you make, you have to slow down, even if it's for two seconds. Right. To make a good decision, right? You can't be reactionary because people's lives are on the line. Mm-hmm. And so I take that with me into filmmaking. Like, it could all be falling. Right. I, I got to take a moment and go, all right, this is what we're going to do. Right. And be decisive right. about it, even if I'm wrong. Right. I mean... We all know, you know, Pete, the thing about directing sometimes is giving direction is right. to send people in a direction. You can always take it back. <laughs> <laughs> That's called take two. You know, I, I remember <laughs> in this and I did a documentary, so I'm I am I am on the on the fringes of of understanding and experience in the military. But I inter- I did a doc on the black first black tankers in World War Two. And I learned about commanders intent. And how like this idea of like, you know, we're going to take we're going to take that hill. Now, I can't tell you I can't prescribe every single thing you're going to do to get to that hill. You know, like you might have to roll a grenade and, and, and duck in a trench and then sprint 25 yards and dive like you, you can't predict it. But like having that like that intention of taking the hill kind of feels like what creatively happens on trying to get a scene in the can, you know, by, with all these different folks with different levels of talent and different personalities and whatnot. Like, it seems like that's why I asked you, because I felt like there might be a a direct bleed through into your success as a director and producer. I, I, yeah, I just, you know, and the other thing, I also think it's respect of chain of command. I mean, we don't talk about in those terms in the film business, but but in the military, there's a chain of command, like there's a protocol, right? There's a, right. a way you do things. Some of the lessons I learned was like, you never embarrass your boss. Right, 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 right. If your commander says, no, this is what we're doing, even if you have a disagreement and you guys talk about it, right? you, you, you get in line. At the end right. of the day, you go, okay, this is the plan. He, he's made this plan. And so I try to, I, I am very much that way when it comes to, especially when I'm not producing, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, like you, you have to, 
you have to hear it out. And you have to like, what was the creative intent? You know, who are these characters? What is the tone? You know, all these things. You you're kind of coming in and getting it from somebody else. Right. You know, and then and then you gotta be the shepherd and the general for the people who built this. My my last question on the, in this, you know, space is like, do you feel that the the respect for that chain of command has dissipated a little bit as now there are so many different ways to get into the industry and folks don't necessarily, I'm kind of leading, I'm answering my own question. Let me, <laughs> let me rephrase that. Do you think that there's been a, 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 a dissipation in the respect for that chain of command? Most definitely. I, I, I think one, I think there's been a, there's been a huge, I think, disrespect to directors in television in general. And what I mean by that, I, I don't mean people mean to be disrespectful. I don't think people come in and go, you know, director is very important. Right. It's extremely important. But nowadays, we are not always allowed to do the job to our fullest. Right. We can come in, we can solve all these problems and we can go, OK, this, this and this, if you would connect to that. And then somebody can just say, nah. <laughs> and you're like, right. huh? We just want this. Right. And you're like, oh, but, uh, okay. Yeah. And, and, and that's not even an, an ego thing. That's more of like, uh, don't you see the problem? Right. Well, I, and, look, I mean, there's yeah. that. Let's live there for a bit because I find that happens a lot, you know, with, you know, producers or, or showrunners or whatever already locked in on wardrobe you know, a hair and makeup, as if these are kind of secondary things to the creative process. And obviously our, we're always there to play in the in the right sandbox, but like there's just times where you're like, you know, whether it's a creative idea of like, I think this color works for what I'm gonna try and tell story-wise, but also sometimes it'll be like, she gotta run in that shit. <laughs> you know, you, you know what I mean? Like, like she yeah. literally has to yeah. run and, and fight in that. And, and then we have to do doubles of it for the stunt and it, and it doesn't work. And it, it's interesting, like the lack of room for interpretation is squashing the elevation of projects, I think, because, you know, you got to let people come in and throw something at it. And then if it doesn't work, cool. But like kind of coming in and having it already prescribed from the top down, I think is a big lost opportunity. Yeah, it's a waste of talent. You know, I think it's, I mean, and and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about Pete just for a second, Professor Pete. This, oh, this is Professor Chapman to me. <laughs> all right. Because, you know, I've, I've looked at a lot of your work over the years and I have some questions for you. And now, they, I mean, look, I, I, and I'll say this right now to get it out of the way. One of the things that I love about your work is your use of camera. I will, I, I, there are, there are moments I go, shit. <laughs> I, that man, shit was nice. Man, I appreciate it. And that. I just want to say that because it's, I think very few television directors I would consider filmmakers. Mm. You know, I mean, there's a side of television directing. Once you're in the game and once you're playing in the sandbox, you could get by by painting by 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 numbers. Yeah. You know, you can show up, DP. So how do we do this? Oh, we do this, this, and this. Okay. Actors, I don't really like to talk to you. I'm a little nervous about talking to actors. So I don't really want to say much. We right. know your character. Okay. And I just got to make sure I have my coverage. Right. And there are ways to walk through this industry like that. And and, and work a long a time. People, a long time. And do and, and from the outside, it looks like decent work. Hmm. You know, but there are very what I call filmmakers, and we and we're lucky enough to know some of the same folks. But when I see people who who change, I can tell. I'm like, oh no, no, that's that's not a part of the canon. That's yeah. different. You right. know. Wow, oh, that's a little more cinematic this episode. I, who did this? Who did this? Who did this? You know, you can tell, you can feel it. Right. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about you. Well, likewise, man, since, since, since we're here, you know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, you were, 
I, I think on last OG, I think you were the first time I had to hand off like a scene to, or yeah, I think it was a whole scene. Oh, yeah. it, it, it was, it was, it was Tracy in the jail. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, God, was it when he met Rakim, uh, giving yeah. him his haircut or something like that? And, you know, you're always a little nervous about what you're going to get, what you're going to look at when you look at, when you log in and look at the dailies. And it was perfect. You know what I mean? And, and I, and I may have told you this before, but I like, Early on, and to this day, I, I mean, I I've probably lost like three jobs to you. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm always like, I get it though, I get it. You know what I mean? And in this in this like beginning of this conversation too, now I under like I even have a better understanding of of of, of why. You know what I mean? It's it's having done that accounting and having had that experience in the military and bringing that you know to to the job where folks know that you're a good EP producing director. So, you know, there's definitely folks where I've been like, uh, why this cat? You know, if I'm being honest, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I mean, you, do. you know, but like every time I'm like, yeah, right choice. So, well, you know, um, yeah. And I didn't mean to cut you off. I apologize. I remember in one of the things I think most people, well, if you know me, you know me. Hmm. Me and Pete have had the, the the pleasure to work together twice. Insecure, right? Like, back to back. Insecure, back to yeah. back. Lasso G. I mean, back to back. You know, I have a throw. I have a throwback photo that I'm going to throw up probably this Thursday. <laughs> um, but you you told me a lot on Insecure. Like you hmm. really were like, yo, look at this, look at this, look at this. Think about this. Think about this. You know. Yeah, you were very, very, very helpful. Because it was my first time playing in that family. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. Well, now nah, this is uh, this is I, I love this. This is great. Well, I guess, and I want to, I want to, when we get back to kind of your work as a TV director, I do want to kind of find somewhere to sit and talk about the the craft, so we can we can figure that out. But after returning to, to Georgia State, I assume that was an undergrad program. Yep. How did you transition in, into the professional, quote unquote, world? So you remember I dropped out of Georgia State. I, I went to Georgia State. I went to Savannah State mm -hmm. for a year, transferred to Georgia State, dropped out, joined the Air Force, got out of the Air Force, went back to Georgia State because it was the only school that had a film program mm -hmm. that I could get into <laughs> and that I could afford. And uh, so I went back, and while I was there, Spike Lee was producing a film called Drop Squad in Atlanta, low budget, independent. And I just begged to get on that film. I begged. I went there every day. They were like, no, nope, no, nope, we ain't got nothing. We've already hired all the PAs. No, nope, no. Nope. I just kept asking. And then eventually they let me be an intern, but also the assistant to the producer as an intern. And then the key set PA didn't show up on the first day. So they threw me in that, but I still had to assist the producer while being the key set PA. And then I just did, but you know, you remember them times, I'm sure like when you're, when you're young and you're like, this is all it is. This is all I got. Right. You know, this is, this is what I've, I have to make it. Like there was not even an option. I right. would have worked 24 hours. I would have, I, yeah. you could have told me to go get your dog, do your laundry in front of you. You know, as long as I could see somebody say action and cut. Right. You know, and, and see the process, I was going to do it. So at the end of the movie, they go, we need somebody to take this office equipment back to New York in a truck, in a U-Haul. Wow. And I was like, I'll do it. And I drove this truck to New York, never been to New York. <laughs> and uh, for those who grew up in, in Jersey and went to school in New York, it's not the same to somebody who's coming from from somewhere else, right? Right. So when you come from when you coming from Atlanta, and you drive through the tunnel, mm -hmm. and you <laughs> and you and you come out, you're like, oh, yeah. And uh, cars is moving. I was like, okay, I, I get there, I drop everything off at the office. They go, we need a office PA for post. Wow. Um, would you, would you like to stay and do that? 
I was still in, I was still in school. Huh. I was like, shit. I called my mom who had already, I thought I disappointed my parents once. So I was like, mom, <laughs> and I'm a grown dude. I, I've been in the military. I, I don't even live at home, but I'm scared. I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm like, mom, they offered me this PA job here in the office, you know, but they me and me dropping out of school again. And she, and she said to me, if it's as hard to get into this business as you say it is, hmm. that building will be there when you get back. And I was like, okay. Hung up the right. phone, packed up my apartment in Atlanta. My roommate was pissed because I was like, I'm out. Rent and, doubled. Uh, <laughs> yeah, his rent doubled. And I was in New York that Monday at work. And I, right. I, I went from studying Spike Lee and other filmmakers to being in a room where Spike Lee was five feet away from me, huh. you know, watching him in the edit room, you know, and then watching these young brothers try to make something. It was right. inspiring to me. And, and I just, it just took off from there. And from there, you know, like I said, I grew with those guys, you yeah. know, more so with Spike's producer, Butch Robinson at the time, who was doing all his commercials and, and Butch was my mentor, you know, He's also the person who co-wrote Drop Squad. And he just really taught me the business. Like, yeah. And then I started coordinating and production managing, line producing commercials, went around the world, you know, with, with Butch and Spike. You know, we did Michael Jackson in Brazil. Like we we was we Oh, were uh, well, uh, um, they don't they don't get they don't care about us. They don't really yep, care. Whatever it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Kings of Comedy. I was a production supervisor on that one. Here's a dumb question. Just, were, were you yeah. starstruck looking at Michael Jackson? No. Nah. No, at first, at first you're like, oh, sh that's, that's Mike. <laughs> right, 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 right. But when you see the entourage, you go like, that's a circus, man. That's just, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it became like something so surreal that you, you could be starstruck. You, you were just kind of in awe of the aura and the process that was around it. It wasn't necessarily him. It was all the other stuff that was. Right. Was right. Crazy. So, so you're doing all this work on, in the commercial space. Are you, are you, how do I want to phrase it? I was going to say, are you happy? But then I, I want to rephrase it. I was going to say, were you beginning to have your eyes on other jobs? You mean when I was a production manager, line producer? Yeah. Yeah. At the time, no, I, 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 I ended up having a, a son really early in life, like 25. Yeah. And so I was focused now, like not on my career path, but on working. Like there was right. a, like, a, all right, if this is what's paying the bills. I'm, you know, and also, I mean, I was doing, I was working on hip hop videos. I mean, life was fun and it was New York and it was just, and you know there was a vibe, and and, and that era was that era was so it was intoxicating. Dope. It was yeah. dope. <laughs> so I I wasn't thinking about being a director. I was, but it wasn't like I gotta do that right now. Right. And Spike and my producer, for whatever reason, stopped working together for a little while, and that was all of my work. And now I had this new baby. And I wasn't working, and it's New York City. And, and I was like, oh, man, what am I going to do? And I was literally on the train platform. I used to be married, so I'm going to say my ex-wife. So on the, on the train platform, subway platform, I see a sign. I want to say it was first season of Oz. Hmm. And I was like, HBO. And I was like, man, HBO is dope. Like, they, hmm. They, you know, they were just starting original programming. And I was like, I'd love to work there. The train rolls up, pulls up, doors open. Me and my ex walk onto the train. And there's a lady that she knows that works at HBO sitting right there. And, and she goes, oh, my God. Mo just said he would love to work at HBO. And here you are. And That's she crazy. says, well, it was crazy. And she just says, well, I'll send you the job listings. You know, just right. take a look to see if there's something there. I did, and they had a free. They had a production manager in promos open, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I applied and 
you had um, you had the full skill set. It was working. It was, yeah. it was, you know, but that's the universe, man. That's, that's, that's the universe and being sincere, I believe, about what your goals are and the universe yeah. will find a way for you. Yeah, and I believe that. I too. ended up there. Yeah, and I ended up at HBO and in the promo department. And I did what I always do is I beg people to let me do something else. Right. And, and I begged to write some spots. And they kept saying no. And eventually they let me do one. It worked. And then they let me do another one. And I quickly moved up the chain and became the creative director of Scene Originals and Film Promotion. How long did and, that take? Uh, probably about a year and a half. So you were you were grinding. You were you were making it clear, like, you know, oh, I'm God. here, I'm I'm a team player, but I also, I like to get buckets <laughs> and I want, I want y'all to know that I can, I can perform. I, I was obsessed, man. I mean, yeah. I was obsessed. Pete, let me ask you, when you, cause I mean, you know, you, you've had a trailblazing career. So do you remember being obsessed to the point where like, it's almost like breathing, like everything you do? Yeah, I mean, still am. You know what I mean? Like, like I, I mean, it's a little different when you got a kid, right? But like, <laughs> no, I remember, you know, the way I picked my job was like, I fine, y'all got me from 901 to 459. From five to, to nine, you know, from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m., all me, you know? And it would be, it would be reading scripts. It would be writing. It would be doing bad writing because I knew I didn't have all day. So I had to just... I would have, I got to do eight to 10 pages every day. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're good because in, in, in two weeks I got a script. Then I'll spend the next month making them better, you know, and let me, let me go to this seminar and let me go to this workshop and let me go make a short film. Like it was, it was kind of, I mean, it's almost diabolically insane to some degree, but like, you, you, it, it is what it is to get where you want to get because that, it's a tough industry. And I feel like all the folks that, you know, kind of come on the podcast and all the folks that, that you and I both know, I feel like there's something similar in that, in that kind of singular drive while still being, being flexible enough and nimble enough to pivot. You know what I mean? Because you know that you can't just, it ain't a straight line to, to anything, especially creative and especially, you know, being who we are in an industry where it's not like people are clamoring for you to fucking make it, <laughs> you, you yeah. know? So, yeah, man. That's real talk. That's real talk. I just, what, what was it, what in your mind turned the dial for you? Mm. Like, what was the project that you did? Now, again, I, I, I know some of the journey already. Yeah. So I, I'm just asking, like, even after you got into the TV game, uh -huh. you know, because um, if I'm, if I'm, I could be wrong, but you sold your movie before you did actual television, right? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was like, oh, seven, oh, eight. I didn't, and I didn't do TV until 2017. See, 2017, 2017. Pete, how many shows have you done since 2017? It's about 60. That's a, I can't even, that's a working motherfucker right there. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's, you know, that I've been, it's been very fortunate. I, and I, and I give it up to the people who, had multiple shows, you know, who were able to hire me over and over again. Cause I mean that the numbers would be, the numbers would be different if it wasn't like, you know, and I've said this on the pod a lot, but like 13 episodes between blackish, grownish and mixedish, like that, that, that's, that's how the numbers got up in the, in the beginning before it was like hopping around to like one, you know, almost like a different show every, like, like, in a, in a calendar year, every show being a different show. But yeah, man, you know how it is. No, I, I look, 
I was just talking about the obsessiveness. And again, all the people that I know who are successful are a little, or was at some point insane. Yeah. You know, they had to be. I, I don't see how you can be in this industry. Right. Well, that's what's interesting too, man. Cause like, you know, like, you know, you met Tristan and, and Jada, she does all the research. So I got, I got your file right here. You know what I'm saying? And what's, it, what's really interesting is that, and it sounds like this is where we're kind of headed, right? Like you started doing titles, title designer for Cedric the Entertainer Presents and the most deaf opening for deaf poetry and, you know, some behind the show pieces for Carnival and Deadwood. Like, when, like, that's some super technical shit. Like I, like, I am not right for that job, like, today. You know what I mean? Like, you can't sit me at a computer and expect a title sequence to come within <laughs> the next month, right? So, like, what, like, when was that just saying, okay, here's a lane, or, you know, staying late night and, 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 and tinkering with the machines? Like, how did you get into a position where you could deliver on that? Um, well, a lot, A, a lot of help, a lot of help, meaning I was fortunate, man. When I was at HBO, it, it, I kind of came up with this idea around, you don't promote the show, you promote the idea of the show. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, writing and directing these campaigns for Six Feet Under and Sex in the City and, and you know, and they're all music driven. They are all metaphorical. I think Six Feet Under, uh, I used that Nina Simone song and they were in a grocery store hmm. and, and I did all this stuff. And, and at the time at HBO, uh, you know, I was, you know, I'm talking to the CEO, I'm talking to the head of program, I'm talking... On a regular, like on a daily basis, yo, what's up, what's up, no, you yeah. know, and, and you're just doing creative work in that environment at that time was about creative. It was all about creative. And so I had some side hustles while I was at the <laughs> job, you know, and, and some of those side hustles where I get calls from some folks like, yo, can you help us with this? And I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> and I'd go over there and like Cedric's thing, you know, because right. I met Stan through Deaf Poetry. He's like, yo, can you come over here and, and help us out on this? And it was less about me actually doing the actual title, but I would concept the title. Like I'd concept it. This is, you know, and, and there is a math to it. Like how many seconds can a shot be up? Because you have to have a name up for so long. And this name is equal right. to that name. And, right. and, you know, the EPs get a certain amount of time. And so there's a lot of math and, and style that you have to kind of bring together. But when I left HBO for good, just to start a production company, uh, they would just call me. And, go and what like, year was that? When did I leave HBO? That's a good question. I want to say 2005 or somewhere around there, 2004. Okay. I'd say the year Entourage came out, I had left probably about a year before that. And then, and that, when I did the main title sequence, I just got a phone call, like, from the head of program and saying, yo, Mo, you want to pitch on the main titles? Mm. And I was like, yeah, I'd never done it before. Let me, yeah, I'll pitch on it. Called up a lot of design buddies. Like, how does this work? You know, right. how do you do this? And then I came up with the concept. How much does of, it cost? How much does it cost? I mean, look, HBO at the time, I wasn't worried about that. Right. You know, they tried to tell me, like, <laughs> we got we got $25,000 for this main title. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. And you just keep pushing. Right. And so I came up with this concept. I won the job so bad that I flew to L.A. I pre-shot it. Wow. As my presentation. Mm. Without the, you know, just my own shooting without the, and yeah, pre-shot it. Did this thing. I spent did my you have money. that that overhead shot, that dope overhead shot where they all get out of the four door convertible? Not in my pre. Okay. Not in my pre. I That's talked a memorable about it, but it sequence. Wasn't. That's a memorable sequence, man. I, it, the moment you said it, I was like, I, I remember all of that shit. 
that was and I, I went in and I pitched this sequence. I showed them what I was going to do. They looked at me and they were like, OK, can you step outside and just wait out in the parking lot? And I was like, yeah. And the next design company was coming in to pitch. Huh. And this other design company, I forgot their name, but they were doing, they've done everybody, like Game of Thrones. And like, like, right. and, I mean, right, not, right. not, but they were huge. Right. And I got a phone call like 30 minutes later to come back inside. And they were like, yeah, we want you to do it. And we want you to do this. Which wow. Just showed us. Wow. And that was that. That's got to be hella validating. It was crazy. It was crazy, but I was I was obsessed about can I create something that people will not get tired of for five years? Right. You know. Now was that the yeah. point? Because was that before True Blood? I think it was True right. Blood. Um, yes. Oh yes. Because I, I feel like I feel like when I think about impactful title sequences, to me. It was it was it was Entourage, and then I feel like there was a few years before True Blood, you know. Not that the other ones weren't great, like you know, Sopranos was cool, but like it was just kind of like it, they were more just about images, and there was less yeah. kind of design or like filtration or effects on the things. But I remember Entourage, and then I remember like Six Feet Under was kind of the next oh, kind yeah, of benchmark, yeah. And then it was like True Detective. And that and that was when it was like, okay, now you you can't mess around with your titles. Your titles are a fucking episode, you know. And and then and then what's disrespectful now is that in the binge watching of it, it's skip intro, skip intro. And it's like you're skipping the whole mood. You're skipping like you're skipping the wind up to like go from whatever the fuck you were doing before you sat down to start getting into the show. You know, and it, yeah. it's it's a it's an art. So respect for that. Man. It is an art. It's an art. And it is a shame that people are doing that. And, you know, I hear you, man. But I, I, I really love the challenge. I really did. This is Anya Adams, the director of Yellow Jackets and the camera. And you're watching Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is Pete Chapman's book from Michael Weezy Productions. The reviews are in. Greg Berlanti says, there's a reason why everyone who works with Pete falls in love with his work. The lessons he imparts here are invaluable. Do yourself a favor and read it cover to cover. From Sarah Gamble, Pete's sharing gold nuggets that will spare you a ton of wasted time and help you channel your drive, talent, and ambition in the most productive way. And from Jesse Williams, this business has everything to do with preparation and expectations. Transitions grounds lessons in reality while empowering our artistry to run free. Not an easy balance to execute. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is available on Amazon and anywhere else you get your books. Don't forget about your mom and pop shops, people. At what point are you saying, okay, I, I want to... Titles are cool, you know, I, I come in, I pitch, I get the job, I go in the parking lot, they call me, you know. <laughs> but like, when, when do you say I wanna start, do, I wanna be behind the camera, I wanna do an episode of TV and, and how do you get there? On a narrative tip, it was, it was pretty much, I was making a really great living in commercials, like outside mm -hmm. of the HBO titles, right? I was, I was, I had an imprint, I had a company called Believe Media, I had a company called Brown Bag, and that company was owned by me and Charles Stone, huh. and, and we had that, yeah, we were doing commercials, and Charles was eventually like, Mo, I, I want to go back into movies, I just want to do movies, uh -huh. so we dissolved Brown Bag, and I stayed at Believe Media, and I mean, commercials can be intoxicating. Like, if you get on a good run, you, there's a party that's like, why would I even, what, I, I, mean, <laughs> I worked hard for two weeks. I'm going to make the same amount of money if I worked on, a, on, on, on something for three months. Right. So you just, you know, you kind of get into this. But that's if you're space. also the producer, though, right? 
No, back in the day. Okay. Back in the day. Again, I'm old. So back in the day, they used to give you guarantees. Like when you sign up for a company, they give you a guarantee. And that could be anywhere from a hundred grand to half a million dollars. Right. And they, and they're saying that they're going to make sure you make that money. Right. And you don't have to pay it back if they don't if it doesn't happen. Wow. So So they better get to selling. Then, that's they yeah. <laughs> And and then on top of that, you you would get profit participation, right? You know, I think by the time I was finished, I was making thirty percent profit participation. Wow! And you know, that's that's like residuals, but you don't have to wait for it, right? <laughs> you know, and so, but me, you've definitely talked about this. I eventually left that model and went back to my own thing because I just. You know, I know production, you know, and somebody taking eighteen percent off the top as a just as a fee mm-hmm. on the production, not not like on the whole thing. I I was like, why, why can they didn't even call for you? They called to work with me. Right. I I I, I want that, you know. Right. <laughs> um and right. so that's how that ended up happening. But what happened was I was I was doing a bunch of commercials and I got a call who used to be my number two at HBO was now the number one of the promo department. Yeah. And she called me and said, Hey Mo, can you do a promo for Veep? And I was like, Nope, I don't do that anymore. Hmm. And she was like, I really need you to help me on this one. It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I said, okay, I'll do it. I do it. Do the job. You know, it's fine. I leave. I find out that Julia wrote a note to Richard Plumpler, basically saying, I really love this guy, Mo. Mm. You know, by this time, it didn't really, I had worked with every celebrity at the network. So I wasn't even like, oh, that's, you know, like right. it was nice of her, but right. it wasn't like, oh my God, you know, like, you know, I was like, cool. <laughs> and then Larry probably about, you know, because you know how it is. Once you work with some folks. Yeah. The you're like, you're like the I, I was in Brazil with Michael Jackson, you know, like, uh, <laughs> the, 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 thanks, so thanks you know for the accolade. Is? Yeah. Thanks for the accolade. Yeah, it's know. cool. It's cool. And she was, but she was, you know, it was nice. And like two or three weeks later, I get another phone call. Mo, can you do this beep thing? And I was like, no, I already said, I don't. I don't want to do promos. Right. You know, I'm trying to transition. And and so basically what happened, they said, please read the script. So they send me a script. And I'm like, 16 pages. What? what? So right. I'm reading. And I'm like, okay. They're trying to tell a little story here. And then I go like, now who are you going to get to play Joe Biden? Like, he's too recognizable. <laughs> Who's going to play Joe Biden? And then they're like, Joe Biden. And then I was like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 back up, back up. What is this? What is this really for? What's this? Right. And it was for the White House Correspondents' Dinner. So I was like, yeah. And next thing you know, I'm at the White House. Wow. Every, like every couple of days. And I'm, you know, it's me, Julia, and a writer. And, you know, we're in D.C. And, you know, we got to shoot you know, 16 pages over the course of a total of, I say, 12 hours, over three days, total wow. hours. Right, right, right. You know. Yeah. And it was just awesome. And we had a great time. I learned so much. I can imagine. Uh, and you can really make anything if you plan it, right? And, and yeah, so that was great. And it aired at the Correspondence Dinner. Wow. Uh, it was on the news that Monday. And that Monday afternoon, I got a call from BET seeing if I wanted to uh, direct an episode of the game. Wow. That's crazy, man. So then that that led. So now you're at this point. Are you feeling like, all right, I can I can take my my direct my um, commercial hat off. I'm in the TV world or let, let's let's book a few more before we we start thinking that, you know, things are are, are pivoting here. I, I honestly didn't think 
I was going to have a TV career. And I'm being honest about that. Like, mm. I come in, I do the, I do the game. It's my first time. And I, I think if, if it wasn't for Mara and Celine, mm-hmm. because they truly were supportive, like really, really supportive. And, you know, and if you don't have support, it don't, first time is, yeah, it's all new. And they were really supportive and the team was supportive and the crew was supportive. And I believe Angela Gomez was my AD. Ah. And, um, small and, world. Uh, and we did it and we, I did it. And, and then I thought I was never going to work again because I didn't have an agent. Yeah, I'm I saying have, you you out here working and getting direct phone calls, you know, and somebody I, I but I assume somebody somewhere was like, why aren't we in on this? Well, Salim and I give him credit when. At, during all this time, I haven't said that I used also I was also VP at BET for a little while. Mm-hmm. Uh, right after the stock market crashed in 2008, things were a little, little dicey out there in, in the commercial space. And they offered me a contract that I couldn't refuse. And I helped launch the game, the show, mm-hmm. the game. And it was the biggest launch, in, I think, at the time in cable. Right. Like, they had like seven something million viewers. Wow. And, and I got to know Mar and Salim just through the process of helping them market their show. Um, and I told them that I wanted direct TV. So it all just kind of came back. And that's, you know, when I talk to folks and I talk to students or I talk to it's like you got to let people know what your intentions are. Yeah. You know, because you never know when an opportunity, they're going to see an opportunity for you. And if you never said anything, it just. And, and so I think it was the seed that were planted in the conversation that were had. And I think the buzz just allowed it to go. Let's let's pull that trigger. Yeah. Did you yeah. did you make a distinction between. <laughs> Like, okay, let me, let me ask this. Do you, do you view the game more as like your first episode just by the, because of the specific nature of, of Veep and how you had to shoot that? Yes. And, and reason being is because, look, at HBO, I could, and, and, I, and I don't mean this in any ego way. Yeah. I've been an executive there for years. So, I knew how it all worked. I could make certain decisions without having to worry about it or somebody to think about it or, right. or get approvals. And it's, a, it's me and, and Julia as the boss regardless, right? right? And it's just me, her, and a writer. Right. So when you have something that's just that small, everything is, is intimate and cool and we can try shit and we can do shit and we can make decisions and, and keep it moving. And right. there's an indie kind of vibe to it. And then when you show up, on the TV show, my first TV show as a director, I'm like, why are there 75 people following me? Huh. You know, on, on this scout. <laughs> right, right, right. You, you, you know, oh, I got to make a speech in front of everybody about every <laughs> scene at this location. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and yeah, so next thing you know, I go from like, oh, oh, okay, I got to, this is a whole thing. Right. And getting behind schedule, like, being efficient on your day, all that was new. And I was not efficient. Mm. I did not make my days, mm-hmm. you know, but they were supportive. And, I, and they allowed me to learn. I, 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 it was so different, brother. I mean, I can't even compare what I did at, for the White House to like, it was different. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just the security clearance alone, you know, w- was an, enough to make it not feel like you were doing TV. All right, so I'm, I'm going to list off some credits just to make sure everybody is, is on the same page. And you can fill in anything that I miss here, but because I know IMDb ain't always accurate. But so we've got Veep, The Game, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Happen Leonard, Wrecked, Suits, Graves, Champagne Ill, Miracle Workers, The Last OG, Lodge 49, Brockmire, Insecure, None of the above. Woke. Killing it. Grand crew. And then there are things for I know that you did the pilot for that maybe aren't an out yet. But um, when did the ball get rolling and you felt like you were kind of in the mix, you know, within the, t- you know, the, the span of these episodes I've just listed? 
I would say the ball, it got rolling pretty quickly. I Once I got, Veep called me to do an episode. And, and once I did that episode, everything else just, I mean, at the time they won, you know, for best comedy. Right. You know, and, and again, I got that show without an agent. I got it because HBO just called me. And, and then I think people are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We lost a slot. You know how it goes now. <laughs> now it's like, who, who got this slot? Who, I don't see who reps him. Nobody reps. And then the phone starts ringing. You right. know, um, and then after Veep, I did Sunny, and so I was just look, and then I went direct. So I was just very fortunate that the first kind of four shows. I mean, the game was huge, but mm-hmm. Veep was a Veep was on a whole another level, and Sunny was on a whole another level, right? And then Wrecked, and I was just lucky to have those those be my four starters. I think and, you you were very for you had a nice cocktail of 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 style of show and complexion of cast because I, I I would say looking at all the things that came after it you were you weren't really battling what some folks end up battling which is you know oh well we're gonna put you on shows with only black cast yeah well I couldn't even there was a weird moment where I felt like black folks weren't allowing me to work with them hmm. I felt like after the game, when I did all these shows, I couldn't get on. Like, I would literally like, hey, try to get me on this show. Try to get me. And I wouldn't get a... Right. I wouldn't get a, a thing back. And it was like, what? I think Insecure, it was probably the first show outside of the game that I would consider to be like a black cast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, I don't know why. I think sometimes people look at the work and the history and they just think, oh, you do this. Right. You know, and I had it happen on the opposite side and I wanted to be in the culture. Like, I really wanted to be in the culture. Not that, look, I, like you, I want to be a filmmaker first. I want to tell stories. I want to talk about character, journey development, all that. World building. But, and I don't want to be limited to just blackness. Right. right. I mean, as a as a as folks who consume media and and entertainment, we know we we look if you're black in America and you watch any amount of TV, you can you, you watch can everything. Navigate. Yeah, you watch everything. And so I made it a yeah yeah I, I wanted to, and then now it, it, I'm it's past that point. Right. So you 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 were the an EP and I'm assuming producing director on Brockmire, right? And so we've talked about that a lot on the podcast. You know, the producing director is there to really ensure that the show is the show across multiple directors and probably handles the largest episodes. Although on that show, did you direct every episode in the season? I did. So I did. I took over season two. Mm-hmm. I didn't do the first season, and and that's a show that I want to say spoiled me. Yeah, because a it was it was low budget, so again, not a lot of interference. Mm-hmm. We had three partners, equal partners: uh, the head writer, uh, Hank Azaria, uh-huh. and myself. Right, and we all had lanes. Right, you know, like I was more the production lane. Right. You know, uh, Hank was more of the the big heavy. Right. You know, and uh, and our writer was the creative, like the, the head creative, because he wrote all the episodes. But it was a partnership in a way of like, we'd have all the scripts written before the season. We'd get them. I'd go through to see if they're producible. Huh. You based know, on based on like whatever your budget was and days per episode, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So we only had we, we only shot that show in like 24 days, the seasons. We shot whole seasons in like 24 days. Right. And so, you know, you you go through. Yeah. You go like, oh, that's crazy. We can't do that. We can do this. Right. And then there are certain rules like we can only have 
15 locations per season. Wow. You know, we have, we can only move the trucks once a week. <laughs> you know, um, they see folks need to hear this because it's like you watch something, but there are so many logistics connected to realizing a show and an episode successfully across an entire season. It, 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 it's a military operation. It is. And they and I think that's how I ended up getting the job. When I went to the meeting, I just talked about some of the production challenges. And, and again, it was like. People, like you said, people don't know, but moving a company from one location to the next costs so much money. And if you can stay in one place where teachers are not doing overnights or not moving the trucks or not, that's a lot of money that gets put back into the production. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we barely had money. So there were just certain rules. And, and I... If I'm an EP on something, I try to come back to that. Like right. I try to look at episodes and go, we we don't have more money, so right. we we can't we can't produce this as though we have more money because you know. And you I love that the typewriter. Writer. It feels good, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's going. Yeah, and, and and you tell me, Pete, do you feel like nowadays that they want? Bigger shows for less money? Well, it, it's deep, man. Production-wise? I, I feel like there's... The first response that comes to mind is like, you know, these streaming shows that out, that are one-hour shows, but they have six to eight more minutes than a broadcast show. So, you know, where is the extra time and where is the idea of like, you know, this is a, a, a little bit of a different beast. But... I definitely think folks are not across every episode, you know, honoring what the page count is and, and what the location demands are, because it's it, it shouldn't be a battle every time, you know, and maybe you got to preserve it and, and, and go big on. It's funny. You mentioned Charles Stone, like when I did, he followed me on Blackish season five, I think. And I got wind of like, well, I knew that he was doing like the Prince episode, a Prince tribute. Yeah. And so like the producer and me and also being like, I'm, I'm family with the show. There were decisions I made so they would have more money because I knew that the music was going to be a motherfucker on that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if I could pick this house versus that and, and, and save y'all 25 dollars, like, let's do it. You know, but I think everybody has to be working from that perspective because unproducible episodes end up with poorly realized scenes because you know you're shooting that big scene that is the scene and you're like then they cut out the part they cut out the other half a day you shot and you're like I had to trailblaze through the pivotal scene because we shot something that we all knew wouldn't make it Oof. I, I think that's the toughest thing is when I read a script and you know from experience when you read the script, well, they're mm -hmm. not going to keep this. Yeah. They're not going to keep this. Oh, this is a repeat. We're repeating. We, we made this point here. Now we're trying to, we're remaking the same point. Right. You know, and you, and you can, what I love about good showrunners is that they will hear you on that uh -huh. and, and they will go, okay, oh, you know what? Let's fix that. Let's fix that. Uh, you got some folks out there who are like, yeah, but let's keep it. I'm like, right. we could do it uh, like this, you know. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Well, what was your? And it's bad. Your, and yeah, go I'll go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just I was saying something you said when you when you have an over ambitious script and you don't have the money or the time. Sometimes it ain't about the money; it's about the time. Mm -hmm. and you don't have the time to produce it properly. It actually makes the whole episode worse. Yeah. You know, because everybody's trying to cut corners everywhere in order to save something that ultimately is probably not that special. Um, wow. Because yeah. you won't have a chance to make it special. Right. And I, I find that hurts the most. Right. 
Yeah, man. No, that's so true. I was going to say it, 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 it'll, it's the analogy of like watching an episode where everybody keeps trying to jump and, you know, knock the basketball from being stuck you know, behind the rim, but nobody could reach it. So it's like, there's no, there's no game. It's just everybody trying to reach for something. What's, what, it, what was your major takeaway from that experience? And I will, and you've, you've touched on the fact that it sounds unique because you weren't necessarily having to like onboard directors, like you, you eat, you each kind of the, the, the three headed team had their own lane, but like, what was your takeaway from that experience as the EP and director on, on that season of Brockmire? My takeaway, my, well, my takeaway was how much I learned about writing mm. and production and how do two things work in the, in the real world when you have to sign something that says, yes, you can make it for this money. When, right. you, get to, when you get to that point where somebody's putting the budget in front of you and you got to sign a little piece of paper that says I can make it for that money. You, things, things get real, real fast. I just learned to be a better producer. I learned to understand that every cost matters. Yeah. And I, I learned that treat your team well and they will go the extra mile for you knowing that it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you take care of your people mm -hmm. and also understand that Every scene is not about hitting a home run. You know, it's the it's the collective nature of scenes, the pieces of scenes that go from one to the other. I think I had to really, really work on that because you know you you want to make everything dope. You're like, oh, this, right? And then you're like, sometimes hit, you're like, hi, hi. you know, <laughs> hey, oh, I'm gonna have the camera roll through here, and, then we're turn <laughs> and, and at the end of the day, it's just two people really talking. Right. That's really all it is. And they're sitting down. Right. So you're just like, oh, I just need some I need some overs and I need a nice big wide shot because I want to get this vista. Right. You know. Right. And getting to that patience inside of you is hard at times. And 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 understanding the power of simplicity, I think, is is what I took from hmm. that. So it seems like the logical next step was to start getting pilots, which you did multiple times. Talk about, talk about the process of coming in the room and, and booking a pilot. Unless like, the, like Veep, they just came right to you and threw it in your lap <laughs> and said, take this. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I think when it comes to pilots, the first pilot I got was kind of, the first pilot I got was not a pilot. It was Let Happen Leonard. They rebooted the second season. Okay. Like they changed everything. They moved locations. They did the whole thing. And, and somebody else was supposed to do that episode, the show creator. And he got a movie at the last second. And they were like, can you step in? And, and I did the first two hours. And had to really hone the world and the look and the world building and all that. And that was that. But the actual first like pitch, pitch, true pitch was probably woke. Mm -hmm. And it just, the script just spoke to me. And I, I just came out of my, my POV. And I think at this point, I didn't care whether I got the job or not. You know, I just really wanted to say what my piece was and what I thought would make it interesting for me. Right. And one of the things, because truth be told, they already had a director hmm. when I when I when I'm interviewed. Right. And and when they did, they were nice enough to tell me after they were well, actually while they were interviewing me, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right and i still gave him my pitch told him all the stuff my biggest thing was is i didn't want the animation to be 2d animation mm -hmm. that i wanted to use practical elements right and do more puppet approach and i had a lot of notes on the script I had a lot of notes and, and 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 a lot of thoughts about the direction of the show and the look and the feel right um and I was just, I was unfiltered and I didn't care if I lost the job. Which is the key, right? Because that, they got to know, 
Well, for the right partner, right? The right partner is looking for somebody who is going to be additive. You know, I remember I had a, I had an interview for a film that Netflix was doing. And so I came in there and I was like, I had my notes and blah, blah. And I was looking, and then I just got the sense. I was like, oh, oh, y'all want to shoot this. <laughs> 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 you know, it was just like blank stares and like a nod here and there. I was like, oh, y'all don't want any notes. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad I did that because I would not have wanted to find that out later. So yeah, man, it's amazing when you come in kind of with a perspective and with a confidence that lets them know that they'll be in in, in specific hands, you know? And I, I don't know. I think for me, I definitely like to come in and get a vibe that this is going to be family. If you, if you, if, if we're working together, Mm -hmm. it's not my way or the highway. And I'm not going to work with you if it's your way or the highway. Like we both are going to not work. Right. I I do want to set this feeling that, that, that I know you worked on this probably for like five years. Right. Or three years. I, I understand that, you know, and I will respect that, but, this is what I would like to bring. And, you know, let's see if we can break it together. And I will say the thing that I found with, and Pete, you definitely don't have this issue. What I'm about to say <laughs> has nothing to do with you. But I, I try to remind certain directors who come and who ask me, like, I don't understand what's happening, why I'm only getting so far. Mm. I think we always got to remember, A, that we're storytellers. So when you walk into the room, the moment you step into the room, you're telling a story. Mm-hmm. It's not just, it's not the nuts and bolts. It's not the this, it's not the that. It's not the, the intellect of it all. It's the emotion of it all. Right. And I think, you know, and that's when you know you know what, what you want to do with it. It's when you really know the emotion of the story and the, right. and the characters. And, the, and I don't know, I just try to walk into a room and not be technical. I try mm-hmm. to walk into a room and be emotional and talk about the journey of the characters and, and what the light means to me. You know, like when I started talking about the look and the feel, it's, it's still all emotional. You right. know, there's, there's, you know, and I think young directors, if they're struggling with their interview process, just you got to remember, they're not, they, they're not there to, they technically get all their shit covered. Right. <laughs> right. They got it covered, you know. Well, what I always uh, I always view it like what makes me like what makes me if they choose to work with me inextricably linked to the success of their show. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like like what so that means, right? Like when you when you sit down and start talking about yourself like you know, certain people are going to hear not and and it's all true, but they're going to hear a version of my journey with different milestones because those milestones are going to speak more to what I want them to emotionally engage with, like you're saying, you know what I mean? Like you got to come in and, you know, you can't just hit play and, 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 and be like, I'm pitching. It's like, it's really a, it's really a date, you know, cause it's such a long term relationship that they're getting involved with. And like, you know, you, you've said so many gems here, like they're, they got to know, like, you know, when you sign on the, for that episode, you know, cost that pattern budget, like that, that's a prenup dog. You know what I mean? Like you, you, this is a real relationship and, and, and they will call you out on it later and they will call you out on it later. And, and, they, and you, you can be divorced from a studio. You can be director Ooh. jailed. Now, do you always come in with like, like a deck and materials or do you, or, or if you, or if you're less technical, are you just kind of like talking um, through what may have been put together in a presentation? Uh, I definitely come with the deck. Mm-hmm. I definitely come with all that. And, you know, and I try to weave my deck in a way that's still a story. And over the years, I've started to put less and less words in my deck. I used to like have, it was all spelled. Like I was right. <laughs> And like and I could read, I could read my deck to you, and it it'll be a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, I, when I look back, I go. But look, I got jobs. But yeah. all, all I would say was, 
Now, when I go back, I'm like, now nah, I'm just going to give like some descriptors here. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get some descriptors there. But, but I think the photo game best be on point. Yes. Like your layout better be on point. Yeah. And, and cause they think that's what they're buying. Like when you show them that shit, if that shit is just kind of like, Oh, it's cute here. Cute there. Yeah. You, your cute ass is going to be out the room. I mean, right. like, you, right. You better be fire. You know? Man. Yeah. And that's, and I'd say you have an advantage from having done from your particular journey with titles and, and all those things and commercials. Like, you know, I, I, I've done really the biggest commercial I've done is for spectrum, but like the amount of, prep work you have to do to get that job. I mean, you basically have to shoot the commercial to get the job and be able to talk through like all the things you intend to do. You know, if you can bring that into these conversations and then still, it, it's the one thing too, like these pitch meetings is, are, are kind of like the one, it's almost the director as the actor in a sense, yeah. right? Because like you've got everything you want to say figured out. like. You know, I I also, you know, I write it all out and I have it on the on the deck on another screen. Like I keep looking over here, but like I don't want to get caught reading it. But like I know like, man, if I could just read that shit, I'd be killing it <laughs> because, you know, because, you know, like you've got that word play and you've got like it's almost like a crutch. But like you have to know the script and all wherever the scene's going and then you got to back out and be able to like you know, respond to what the other actor is doing, which is the executives on the other side. Cause they're, they're not, they, they not, they might not let you talk for 45 seconds straight. They might ask a question and then you got to reload and reconfigure your whole thing because now they just took you away from where you were going. So how do you get back there? You know? Hey Pete, I got a thing that I do. Like I have my script. Look, I, I talk about emotion, but I work all that shit out. Like you just work that shit out, right? You know, this this shit is all typed up. And I take my, if it's Zoom, I take my things and I put them right, the boxes of the people right at the top. Uh huh. And and I try to make it as small as possible. And I have my I have my script take up most of the screen, so right. that I'm always looking in the same area. Right. But I can still check these folks every now and then, but I, yeah. I, I try to divorce myself from them as much as I can. And yeah, but I, nah, man, just so many real world cheat shits, man. <laughs> but so, so you know. do, so the, you know, from, so what you've done, how many pilots you've done two at this point or three? Champagne deal technically is the pilot. Mm-hmm. Woke. Mm-hmm. Grand crew. And Grand crew. And uh, none of the above, which was for what was what's the division at ABC Free Freeform Freeform Uh huh Freeform was so, that Kenny's script? Yeah, that was Kenny's. Okay, that was Kenny's which, script. And he, and y'all met on the game, right? And we met on the game. See, the I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know. that's four. So that's those are four. Yeah, Grand Cru. Yeah, those are the four official pilots that I did. And so, like, stepping out of that, I have two, well, no, one question. What's, like, the, what's the biggest thing that you learned coming out of, you know, your four pilots that you'll apply to the, to the fifth? Each one was its own beast. Each pilot was its own problem or challenge. Mm-hmm. And I think when it came to Champion Ill a lot of that was already kind of already heading in a certain direction. So it was more about coming in and, and finding my lane with these guys mm-hmm. and kind of just trying to make something good, you know, but they they were so heavy in it already. Right. That, and, and the show was already picked up for a season, right? They, they bought it before we shot it. Right. So the, the, the dynamics were different. Woke, you don't know if they're going to go or not. And right. one of the things that I learned was put it from the producer was put it all on the table, everything. You don't know if they're coming back. Mm-hmm. You don't don't even worry about how they're going to shoot the rest of the season. Right. You made the best damn episode, you know, whether it's too expensive for us to keep doing. But if you made the best episode, they'll buy it. Can I can I and, stop you right there? What is your 
what makes it the best damn episode? Like, like, is it cinematic coverage? Is it, you know, taking more time with performance? Like what are, what are the three things that, that you, you would do on a pilot that you wouldn't do as a, as a guest director? On a pilot, I would scrutinize the scenes harder. Mm. Meaning I would probably fight longer for things that I want. You know, I'd really like, no, no. We just got the battle. You right. know, if, if I'm a visiting director, I battle, but it is eventually, you know, A, to scrutinize and seeing casting. Mm -hmm. The casting, being so involved in the casting. And, 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 you know, and, and third, hiring the DP, mm -hmm. like, you know, like those, for me, all the creative elements, making sure the DP, the production designer and cast that I truly am on board with, not that I'm okay, this is what I'm working with. No, right. right no. Right. And, you know, if they bought me for the pilot, that means they bought my approach. When I sat down, I talked to them and I told them about oh, if you buy that approach, this is what I need to make that approach. Right. And I think it's about learning, and it's hard for me, uh, you know, to be unapologetic mm -hmm. about what you feel is what you need to make a great episode. Right. And I think, and I had great partners, and I think, I feel bad that the one me and Kenny did did not go. I, I would say in hindsight, there were things, because I love Kenny. I love Kenny. So there are things that Kenny wanted that I may not necessarily have wanted mm -hmm. or like done that. And I think, and, and I want to support him so much that I don't know if I always supported myself. Right. 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 You know, and I wanted him to win. And sometimes wanting your friend to win or wanting somebody, you know, and love to win, you still have to be that dude sometimes. Right. And when you're not that dude, it doesn't help. Anyway. Right. That's deep, man. That's deep. Sorry. Sorry to get in the way of the of the of the takeaways from the pilots. I, but I, I I just wanted to ask because I've I, I've seen, you know, a variety of pilots and I've often felt like what I would do is, <clears throat> you know, like try and make this thing look so good that it's undeniably sexy, attractive and the best version of itself, you know, and, and, and whatever that means. Yeah, I agree. I, you, you, it's got to look, look, man. Nowadays, your your pilot better stand out. Yeah, and and that that means the look of it. And, and when I say the look, there's commercial look, but Pete, you know this. There's style to a look, mm -hmm. and I think what a lot of people don't have is style to a look. That's why certain things just, you know, that's why the bear is the bear. <laughs> that's why Atlanta is Atlanta. It's not because the bear, we've never seen people who have high anxiety and high pressure and camera shake. We've right. all seen that. But what Hero brought to that pilot just as a filmmaker right. and the intensity to that and where that camera was placed, that's what I mean about style. You know, yeah. it's yeah. like, oh. Right. So, so did I, sorry, did I, did I, did I step on the pilot takeaways with my, with my second question there? <laughs> oh, I, I don't, I, no, I mean, my pilot takeaways are literally, you just have to put it all on the table, which I think we talked about. Yeah. And if you're the pilot director, every creative decision you have to be comfortable with, mm -hmm. you have to be a hundred percent on board. And if you're not, it will show up somehow right right even if it's only subconsciously for the viewer like that was a that was weird or yeah <laughs> so this is the the rounding third portion of the interview i love to ask what shall i start with now i normally ask this of actors but i, I want to ask you if there were a project made about your life what genre would it be what format, you know, film, episodic, document, whatever, who would direct it and who would star as you? Oh, shit. All right. That's a good one. I think if there is a thing about my life, it would be. Let me start with tone. I think it would be a mixed bag, meaning it would be 
weird. <laughs> it'd be true friends. It'd probably be a lot like woke. Huh. Okay. You know, it it would it would be mixed media, and it would be a dramedy. And and I would I would love for it to feel experimental, but at the same time, grounded enough that the experiment didn't get in the way mm. of, of 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 the story. That's and I think as far as a filmmaker, wow, that you know it depends on every era and genre. I mean, like, I mean, not every era. Like, if you would ask me this when I was younger, I would have said Michelle Gondry. Huh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> you uh-huh. know, because he was just doing some wild camera flip stuff that I was like, but wow, who would I, who would I? Oh, that's so good, man. Um, See, I can't even say it because there's some people that we know that be like, mm. <laughs> Yo, you don't think I can do your story? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's I a season. You, uh, it's a season. They, they get an episode. They get an episode later. They get an episode. I tell you, I, t- um, I look at I look at Rick from Dope, and I look at Dope, and I just go. I feel like that that was a lot of that was me. Rick Famuyiwa. Uh, yeah. And you know, it's Rick. And then I think, yeah, I mean, I like Rick and I forget this brother's name. Oh, why? But he did that episode in The Watchmen, the black and white, the Was it Steven? Um Yeah. I know what you're talking about. I can... Yeah. I mean he inspired me that season. Like when I saw that episode, he blew me away. But I'd say Rick. I'd say Rick. Okay. I feel like I feel. And who would play me? Yeah. Oh man, who would play Mo Marab? Oh shit. You still you still acting, Pete? You you, you still dabbling? In- <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stephen Williams. I had to look. I had to look his name up. So so we had that in there. No, I don't. You don't want me acting in nothing, man. It, it it's not a, it, it's not going to be what you want. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that, but you know, that might be a dinner conversation. I I got to get into it with you about that acting. I don't know. I mean, I could go. Uh, Lamorne, I could go. Yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one, brother. I'm sorry. I got to pass on that. I can't even. Yeah, that's I, too. Okay. That's. T- I like my the question me. because it, it requires some real consideration. So, all right, so, so let's slide into home. What three characteristics do you think a director needs to make it in this business? Your characteristic obsession. He needs to be mm-hmm. obsessive. He or she needs to be obsessive. Two, it all seems negative, but entitled. Mm. And I mean that in the best of ways, meaning that in the ways of you you feel entitled to have an opinion. You feel entitled to to lead. Mm-hmm. You know you, you you know you belong and here. I belong here. You belong here. Yeah, and especially if you're black or a woman or just any person of color, they really don't make it easy, and they don't feeling entitled is a struggle. Yeah. You know, empowerment is not something that is is widely talked about or given in this business to us. Right. Empowerment. And 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 so I just think that sometimes you you, you just got to be feel entitled and use your entitlement and use your power. Thirdly, I think characteristic wise. You got to be honest. Hmm. I know that's, but what I mean by that is honesty in, in the work. And when you're not honest in the work, it shows. And I've definitely not been honest in my work mm-hmm. where you, you try something that's not really you. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oof, oh no, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not honest. So yeah, I think honesty, entitled, and obsessive. All right, I love it. I love it. Well, 
This goes into a, the the category of friends I've learned more about after the interview. So it, it's it's really been a pleasure, man. I think last I saw you, we were eating steaks in Vancouver, Where? right? Yeah, in, in some in yeah. that cold ass weather. And that show just got pulled. The show you were on just got pulled. That's uh, Spider Week. Wow. Yeah, it's a it's a crazy time. It's a crazy time. Well, maybe hopefully it'll find another home because. Uh, the show I was on went from HBO to uh, HBO Max to Netflix. So we'll see oh, what happens. Ours. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, fingers crossed. And, um, but, uh, hey, before we get into the drops, I just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to uh, speak to you on this podcast. Uh, Pete, you are, you are you're one of the people that I truly admire and I truly follow. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, and I mean that in the, in the sincerest in most humbling way. And I joke when I call you Professor Chapman, but you really are Professor Chapman. And, and I mean that in a way that, as you already know, I'm not, for most people, this is probably the most you've heard me, people will hear me speak. I am not, I, I'm a lay low in the cut kind of doing, just kind of just watching, yeah. listening, watching. And one thing that, you know, and everybody knows this one thing about you, Pete, is that, you have a voice and you use it for the right reasons. And, and, and the way you mentor and the way you put on information that I don't think was, I know for a fact was not around when I was coming through, mm. you know, people weren't putting that information out and people weren't talking about it in that way. And, you know, everything from scriptation to storyboards to shot designer to here's just something I did today. To, oh, did you guys check this out? Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that is really special. And again, your work is really great, Pete. Well, that mean that means a lot coming from you, man, because it, it it's a two way street. And I'm hoping we'll be passing the baton off to one another on some show real soon, because it seems like that's the only way that it happens. So, uh, well, I want to work with you as an EP. I want you to be an EP on something that I that I get to work on. Hey. I, I had, I, you know, interviews are happening. So hopefully something happens and I can, I can make that call. Cause I, 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 I've learned on, in my experience too. So I'm, I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to do that job again. Brother Mo, thank you, man, for, for swinging by the pod. It's been a pleasure. It's really great. What's up people, this is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on IG via at Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C-H-A-T-M-O-N. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is produced and edited by the multi-talented cut creator Tristan Nash. Assistant produced by the young mogul Jada George and features the wonderfully gifted Kelly McCreary as our announcer. It's written by yours truly, but I mostly come up with these questions on the fly, which you've probably noticed. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is sponsored by Sweat Equity, so go ahead and get your podcast swag via PeteChapman.com and leave a review on iTunes if so inclined. That shit matters. All right, y'all. Thanks for tuning in to episode 55. Join us next week when we have our special guest, Princess Monique Films, for episode 56 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. And as always, y'all, stay safe, spread love, and keep creating.